Hey, I'm Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. It's so good to be here with you. I wish we were together in person, but we are not. So I hope these videos can prove some poor substitute for an actual uh, American Battlefield Trust conference of some sort, or at least, you know, keep the Band-Aid on until we can all meet together once the world isn't such a strange place. But on to some history here. Um, we are in the middle of the Overland Campaign, and I at least place the Overland Campaign sort of in, you know, one of the five grand movements in the east of the Civil War. You know, they start around Manassas, went down toward Richmond. The armies moved up toward, uh, you know, Maryland. Eventually, they moved back down toward Fredericksburg, and then they went up into Pennsylvania and then inexorably slowly down, of course, toward Richmond at Appomattox, you know, that's a gross sort of summary. And what I want to get into here is that, you know, it's easy to do it just the way I did it and say, well, I guess Gettysburg happened and then the wilderness happened, but there was a lot of other things in between. I would say the Chantillys and Cedar Mountains, you know, and um, Bristos of the world, you know, are every bit as important as the other things if you want to understand our subject. And we're going to start talking today about one of those sort of things that's often skipped over. People often study this overland campaign, the wilderness in Spotsylvania, and then they probably think the next thing that happened, most people, is Cold Harbor, when in fact, there are other actions in between at the North Anna, at Paw's Shop, along Totopotomy Creek, before you even get to Cold Harbor, which is full of misunderstandings as well. So to start to untangle some of that and to get into this North Anna campaign, let's bring on Bobby Crick. You know him already, National Park Service historian, expert on Richmond and many other things. Thanks for joining us, Bobby. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I can reiterate what Gary just said, um, cheerfully, honestly, uh, traditionally over the years, Tourists and historians have skipped directly from Spotsylvania to Cold Harbor, making a 10, 12, 14 day leap as if nothing had happened in the last week and a half of May. And part of that was because of the lack of preservation, the lack of accessibility for the public and for all of us to the North Anna sites. And that has changed in recent years thanks mostly to the trust, which has preserved so much important land here. And so a sustainable tour of the North Anna battlefield and uh, a experience that knits together the two famous ends of the Overland Campaign, the Spot Wilderness Spotsylvania part and the Cold Harbor part, something now exists that ties that together and makes North Anna much more tourable, if that is even a word. Now, North Anna is generally considered to have stretched from May 23 to May 26 of 1864. It involved essentially all of the infantry of both armies, the Federal Army, was missing most of its cavalry. Phil Sheridan, the Cavalry Corps commander, had carried away most of the mounted arm of Grant's Army of the Potomac, Grant and Meade's Army of the Potomac, on a raid which extended from May 9 until May 24. So when the armies approached this ground at North Anna, the Federal Cavalry was by and large not present. The Confederates were all here. Confederate Cavalry was missing Jeb Stewart, who had been mortally wounded at Yellow Tavern a week and a half earlier. But by and large, the strength of both armies was full as the armies approached the North Anna River. Now, a little geography is essential when you look at North Anna and the, the middle part of the Overland Campaign. Now, the North Anna River flows from west to east across central Virginia. It joins the South Anna River and forms the Pamunkey River before flowing eastward off toward the coast of Virginia. So the North Anna River would be a stride any north-south operations between Fredericksburg and Richmond. The North Anna is probably between 20 and 25 miles north of Richmond, and it's the first decent defensible position south of Fredericksburg. In fact, back in December of 1862, Robert E. Lee had contemplated for a while making his line of defense along the North Anna. Ultimately, he chose the Rappahannock River the area around Fredericksburg being more defensible in his opinion, but he had contemplated the merits, the pros and cons of the North Anna. Anyone who has ever driven Interstate 95 south of Fredericksburg sits in stop and grow traffic in the 21st century. We know how flat Caroline County, Virginia is, how indefensible the landscape and the terrain were and are between Fredericksburg and the North Anna River. And so when Lee was maneuvered out of position at Spotsylvania starting on May 20, May 21 of 1864. There was no question where he had to go, and that was to the North Anna River, which is about a mile and a half over my shoulder, the camera now facing south. Immediately to the left of the camera is a trace of the original historic Telegraph Road 
This was the primary way between Fredericksburg and Richmond, countless hundreds of thousands of soldiers during campaigns between 1861 and 1865 marched back and forth along this road. And here's a little strip of it. There are several such strips in Caroline County and Hanover County. We're stopped in the yard, directly over my shoulder, you can see it, the yard of Carmel Church, which is thought to be at least partially an historic building, a witness to what happened here when the armies arrived on May the 23rd. There's a little bit of uncertainty about it. The church was built in the 1830s. The current congregation believes that the front portion only of the main church, uh, the, the edifice and the, uh, the pinkish bricks there, are probably original to the antebellum church. The rest of it has been rebuilt since the Civil War. We do have some material about uh, Edward Porter Alexander, the famous Confederate artillerist and memoirist, uh, presiding over a court-martial there earlier in the war before North Anna. We also know that William Nelson Pendleton, the pious chief artillerist in Lee's army, preached from inside Carmel Church. That also predated the time that the armies arrived here in May of 1864. So to get us to the battle itself, Grant had divided his four corps of infantry into parallel columns to march more rapidly southward once they had disengaged from Spotsylvania. Robert E. Lee had a great advantage because he knew precisely where he was going and had a direct line to do it. So the balance of his army on parallel roads hustled back south of the North Anna River and were in position before May the 23rd of 1864. Not so easy for the Federals. Uh, the logistics of a movement of an army of that size across barren Caroline County was troubling. And I will break out some arithmetic to illustrate my point. This is a statistic I only discovered a while ago, not that it was a secret, but it carries great meaning, I think. Rufus Ingalls, quartermaster for the Federal Army, said that at the start of the Overland Campaign, the Army of the Potomac had 4,300 wagons, 835 ambulances, and a total of 56,500 animals. Now, presumably that would include Sheridan's 12,000 cavalry horses, but that's still an immense amount of animals. I measured. It is 19.84 miles from where we are standing to Spotsylvania Courthouse, where the armies had last engaged. That's 105,000 feet. So that means one animal for every 1.875 feet between here and Spotsylvania County. When you think of it in that terms, it's not even physically possible. If you lined up every animal in Grant's army, they would have stretched from beyond here to beyond Spotsylvania Courthouse. And so maneuvering and manipulating that mass of manpower and horse flesh and mule flesh was a challenge. And Grant struggled a little bit with that and inevitably was slow which in turn allowed the Confederates to get into a defensible position at the North Anna. When Grant's army finally did approach, the Union V Corps under Governor Warren led the way, followed closely by Hancock's II Corps. They were bedeviled by poor maps, believe it or not. Even in this fourth spring of the Civil War, mapping was a little bit of an issue. On the morning of May the 23rd, from right about here at Carmel Church, Governor Warren sent a dispatch in which he says, the map is so erroneous that it is difficult to tell which way to go by anything named on it. They commandeered local guides. Warren eventually started south on the turn or on the telegraph road toward the North Anna, realized that was wrong, turned around, backpedaled, and came up to right here at Carmel Church and turned west, which is to the right of the camera, and marched four or five miles upriver toward Jericho Mill. Hancock's 2nd Corps arrived here, found the roads clogged, waited a little bit, and then proceeded due south on the Telegraph Road toward where he thought there was a ford over the North Anna, but in fact there was a bridge called Chesterfield Bridge, uh, which carried the Telegraph Road across the North Anna. So while the two leading Corps commanders figured those things out, the Confederates prepared a defense. The North Anna is def was defensible relative to many other sites, but it's a fiction to say that it was completely defensible because it's crossable at countless positions. Infantry could cross the North Anna River almost anywhere they wanted, even without a pontoon bridge. The North Anna was more of an obstacle, more of a speed bump than an actual last ditch line of defense. And if the armies had stayed here long enough, Grant certainly could have crossed upriver or downriver 
without the Confederates knowing it. So this is more a place to force the Union Army to slow down and for, the Lee, for Lee to look for opportunities to find a vulnerable fragment of Grant's army and smash it, as he'd been doing for the previous two years in Virginia. Now, the fighting on May the 23rd actually sprung up at two different places, neither of which we can see from here at Carmel Church. A mile and a half to our south at Chesterfield Bridge, Hancock's men stormed a Confederate fort on this side of the river, known as Hennigan's Redoubt. Confederates had unwisely not yet abandoned it, nor had they burned the bridge over the North Anna, and Bernie's division of the Union Second Corps swarmed over Hennigan's Redoubt, captured it, and seized the bridge over the North Anna intact. And upriver, to your right, at Jericho Mill, Warren's Fifth Corps crossed, splashed across, and then built pontoon bridges for the rest of the Fifth Corps, and there were struck by Cadmus Wilcox's Confederate division, and that produced the biggest fighting of the North Anna campaign, the Battle of Jericho Mill, or Jericho Ford, a battlefield preserved lock, stock, and barrel by the Trust a few years ago, 650 acres contiguous, uh, most of which is now controlled by the National Park Service, Richmond National Battlefield Park, preserved forever, I'm happy to say. On May the 24th, the second day of the experience at North Anna, Ulysses Grant and George Meade pulled into the yard right here where we're standing at Carmel Church and established their field headquarters inside the church over my shoulder. And they spent a long, hot, dusty day here trying to interpret the intelligence they had gathered from the front and for the most part failing. For most of May the 24th, Grant and Meade believed that the Confederates were retreating from the North Anna River to the South Anna River, the next fallback position. And it took them nearly all day to realize that in fact Lee had not retreated from the North Anna, but had created his famous inverted V position, which was a dangerous trap into which he lured the Army of the Potomac. I'll give you one final quote here about the church, what it was like on May the 24th. We're blessed with a lot of good material from men who were here that day. Theodore Lyman of Meade's staff, Dana, the Assistant Secretary of War, several others. Um, Theodore Lyman, writing in his diary on May the 24th, said it was a most hot, dry, dusty, and barren corner, meaning this intersection, and we boiled in a semi-idiotic state for hours. Goes on to describe how the federal officers had taken the church pews inside the church and set them up carefully and were using them as writing tables as they uh, received and sent dispatches, looked precisely like a town hall, Theodore Lyman said. And George Meade himself, writing to his wife that night, or that morning rather, May the 24th, said, I am writing this letter in the house of God, used for general headquarters. What a scene and commentary on the times. Jerry? Great. Great stuff. Thank you. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this. Again, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. And whether you're a member of the trust or not, we hope you're really um, enjoying this, this little trip. And this is one of several videos that uh, should come sort of in order before and after this one where we're talking about North Anna. I might have a question or two for Bobby here because here we are. It's May of 1864 uh, and the Union Army sort of is new again, right? They've got this new general in chief commanding all the armies. You've got this sort of ninth corps component that's not a part of the army and that it is part of the Union Army. And Grant and Meade don't exactly get along, and then the cavalry guy, Sheridan, is coming sort of from the west with Grant. So could you talk a little bit? It seems like when they're here uh, at Carmel Church, Grant and Meade aren't getting along, but yet Grant keeps him on for the whole rest of the war. Why? That's one of the most um, often discussed questions when we get out into the field, not so much at Wilderness in Spotsylvania, a little bit, but more at North Anna, where Grant and Meade apparently uh, snipped at each other, sniped at each other a little bit, and then further at Cold Harbor. Uh, where some finger pointing uh, commenced. Uh, and so to Gary's general question, uh, I think George Meade was so duty bound, or so devoted to duty, such an old fashioned army officer, that he was willing to put up with what he considered bad treatment. And Grant, being a newcomer from the West, and as Gary said, not quite familiar with all of the principals and all the players, had to have a liaison had to have a bridge between himself and the meat and potatoes of the Army of the Potomac. And we see it even on the first day at the Wilderness where Grant expressed some displeasure with how the Army of the Potomac did some things and Meade rose to their defense. But this is the third or third and a half week of the Overland Campaign and some of that uh, 
some of that fuzzy glow had worn off a little bit. And so there were two or three episodes here at North Anna uh, that helped to illustrate the uh, unraveling or at least the, 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 uh, the, the mild discomfort in the Grant and Meade relationship. At one point, one of them galloped past the other and left him in a cloud of dust, kind of uh, childishly. And then here at, uh, at Carmel Church itself, the famous episode where uh, Dana, the Assistant Secretary of the War, uh, had the uh, bad judgment to read a fawning dispatch from General Sherman in the West explaining how the Army in the West had done all sorts of things and now if only General Grant uh, could uh, get the Army of the Potomac to fight equally well, everything would be fine. And in fact, uh, rather than just tell you the story, I'll read you the quote from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Lyman. When Meade heard that, his, gr his gray eyes grew like a rattlesnake's. I consider that dispatch an insult to the Army I command, and to me personally, the Army of the Potomac does not require General Grant's inspiration or anybody else's inspiration to make it fight. And then Lyman says, Meade did not get over that all day, and at dinner he spoke of the Western troops as, quote, an armed rabble. Now, none of that was Grant's fault. None of it was Meade's fault particularly, but the, 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 the little crack, the little wedge between their relationship uh, opened a little bit wider here at the North Anna, and then at Cold Harbor, where there was plenty of blame to be apportioned, it grew much wider as everyone tried to avoid uh, being saddled with responsibility for the disaster there. Great. Thanks so much, Bobby. So we have a lot more to talk about. And I mean, this is not specific to Grant and Meade. Lincoln is dealing with it. Uh, Jefferson Davis is dealing with it. And to be sure, Lee is dealing with it, especially as the war went on a little bit further, as maybe you don't have the exact people you wish you'd have in order to be on your team. And in the end, these endeavors, whether it be business or war, come down to personal relationships between men and women, subordinates and superiors, and colleagues and whatnot. So we got to make sure we study that part of the war. We're going to be hopping on to other places. Uh, Bobby and I will be back pretty soon. So for now, uh, we'll see you later. And thank you. Thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation. Hey everybody, I'm Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. We got Chris White behind the camera and we're with Bobby Crick, who I'll introduce in a second. I sort of just did. And after a difficult and nasty forced march to get out here, we're at a very cool place right next to the North Anna River. So we're going to be talking about some of the actions in late May along the North Anna River, known as the Battle of North Anna. Uh, there are various ways to cross. Uh, the North Anna River, of course, even if, if you watched the other video, you would have seen that the maps weren't clear on what's a bridge and what's a ford, but you do have a, a crossing, sort of a ford at Jericho Mill. You have a ford at Ox Ford, so to speak, and then you had a substantial bridge that Bobby mentioned in the last video here called the Chesterfield Bridge along the Telegraph Road, a road that is so important it actually helped to dictate the war. I would wager, or at least I would posit, that the Battle of First Manassas or Bull Run might not have been fought there were it not for this specific road and the railroads that ran along it. So we're going to get into that. We're going to show you some cool stuff on the Trust property. Before we're done, we'll show you some of the things you helped preserve you, the members of the American Battlefield Trust, and maybe some buttermilk and fallen bricks and Hancock and Lee and Alexander might come into it. Bringing back Bobby Crick, uh, National Park Service historian at the Richmond National Battlefield Park.
Well, it's looming over my shoulder, and the reason we made the hideous trek that Gary referenced was to get down here to the abutment of the Chesterfield Bridge. We're on the south side of the North Anna River, and this is part of the road network for the Telegraph Road. Uh, obviously, if you can see it well over my shoulder, there's some modern improvements. Uh, we're not sure if the foundation, the lower tier, is original to the 1860s. It may well be, but the upper part certainly has been repaired. This bridge and the original Telegraph Road fell out of use in the 1920s or the early 1930s, replaced by modern Route 1, which is what people travel today when they're trying to avoid Interstate 95. But on the afternoon and early evening, and, and even right at twilight on May 23rd of 1864, this was an extremely uh, hot and interesting place. Uh, the Battle of Hennigan's Redoubt had concluded just minutes before sunset on the 23rd. General Lee, for some reason that's never been fully explained, unwisely left one brigade of infantry on the north bank of the North Anna River. That's what most of us know is Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade from earlier in the war, now commanded by Colonel Hennigan, uh, the senior colonel in that brigade. And for some reason, they were not extracted as Grant's army approached from the north on the afternoon of the 23rd, nor were preparations made, as far as we know, to burn the bridge. So the span of the bridge started here over my shoulder and went over your camera and behind you. The river is maybe 100 yards behind the camera. The river itself is maybe 50 yards wide, and then there are surviving abutments of this bridge on private property on the north bank of the river, very close to Hennigan's Redoubt. The troops that captured Hennigan's Redoubt did so with a direct frontal assault using over, uh, overwhelming manpower, Bernie's division, against just Kershaw's somewhat small brigade. The troops that actually captured the fort and the adjacent uh, outlying dirt embankments Mostly were old veterans of the Union Third Corps before the Third Corps had been dissolved. So, for instance, some of the New York regiments that had been in Sickles' brigade in 1862, the Excelsior Brigade, uh, and some of the others were all participants in that. Uh, the fight was actually not that large. It was mostly focused around the redoubt itself. The Confederates who escaped came galloping back across the bridge, right over, over our heads, to safety. But again, nobody had made preparations for destroying the bridge. And so the Union troops in the twilight, even into the early darkness, came storming across the bridge trying to ensure that no Confederate could light it on fire. I have one account that I will read from a New Yorker, 93rd New York, it says the regiment attempted to charge across the bridge and got nearly across when they met with such a severe volley that they had to fall back. The color bearer was shot and fell on the bridge, and Lieutenant Ball of Company K ran back and brought off the colors safely. Now this could have been catastrophic for the Confederates. It could have been a Civil War version of uh, the bridge at Remagen from World War II. Failed to destroy the only significant bridge across the North Anna, thereby allowing Grant's army to cross the burial barrier. The whole point that the army had been here was to protect the line of the North Anna. As many people know, this actually worked to the benefit of the Confederates because Grant's army also crossed upriver at Jericho Mill and that gave him two lodgements at widely separated locations, and the Confederates kept the high ground at Ox Ford, which Gary mentioned a moment ago, and this is what created the famous inverted V of Lee's line. And earlier I called it a trap, and that certainly conveys the right sense of things, but trap is not the perfect word because it uh, implies that it was intentional, and I'm not sure that it was. I think Lee improvised once he had lost the river on his right and he had lost the river on his left and only had the river in his center. He created that folded umbrella or upside down V with Union troops in three different locations. Jericho Mill south of the river, opposite Oxford north of the river, and here at Chesterfield Bridge south of the river. That negated Grant's manpower advantage and created a situation where the Confederates potentially could deal with some bite-sized scoops. Now just up the hill from here is the historic Fox House. This was all part of the Fox property during the battle, and it redounds with interesting stories and sights. Gary? And I just want to say, I, we may have already flashed some of them up on the video, but it bears repeating. I mean, it's incredible how one photographer following an army can really, uh, you know, 
help us to understand a battle, a battlefield, an American history a little bit better. Uh, Timothy O'Sullivan was active within, while the Union Army was still crossing a Jericho Mill, there he is. He documents the railroad bridge across the North Anna River, uh, soldiers bathing in the North Anna, and of course gets this Chesterfield Bridge very well, helping us to see some of the property you're going to see um, in the next video across the way near the Fox House. So we, we use these photos and we use them in combination with the accounts that Bobby just mentioned. Somehow being able to see this abutment and seeing that part of the bridge where maybe that soldier fell, um, you know, helps us understand this and get at it a little bit better. So we're going to pick up on the other side. All right, now we're about, I don't know, half a mile south of where we were before. I'm trying to scream over all the cicadas in here at the beautiful Fox Turner House that Bobby already referenced. Uh, uh, the members of the American Battlefield Trust, we couldn't be more pleased uh, with that partnership and the federal government, the American Battlefield Protection Program, coming together to preserve this absolutely essential property in 2018. We're talking about 125 plus acres around it as well. Um, and the house and the schoolhouse next to it are actually just, just absolutely beautiful uh, mid-19th century constructions. And uh, we were able to get a grant from the Flippo Foundation, thank you very much, to cover most of, not the restoration, but the stabilization and the sort of uh, preservation of the home. You can see it's in a state where it's sort of boarded up and that's just what we needed. We needed to keep the elements out, make sure it was in a safe place. So that was really just great. And the house itself has so many great stories um, that Bobby Crick's gonna come back and tell you. So come on, Bobby. Well, people have been looking at the Fox House, people who are interested in the Civil War have been looking at it for uh, generations as you whistle by on Route 1, but no one's ever been able to stop here before. Uh, tour groups of the North Anna Battlefield and of the Overland Campaign have never had the opportunity to stop here before, so this is pretty significant in a lot of ways, apart from just the intrinsic value of the house and the property and this portion of the North Anna Battlefield. The house itself dates probably to about 1830. And it was purchased in 1840 by the Reverend Thomas Fox, and so we know this as the Fox House, because he still had it in 1864 when the armies came here. It was known locally as Ellington, that was the name of the house. And if there was any doubt about how different things were 180 years ago, consider this. The Reverend Fox had uh, studied to be a lawyer, but according to the family, he abandoned the law and took up school teaching as a more remunerative means of living. So he gave up being a lawyer so he could make more money teaching school. And that explains the outbuilding here, just to the left of the camera, which is a, a antebellum brick structure where Reverend Fox ran a boys' academy between 1840 and the early 1870s. Based on some of the census returns from 1850 and 1860, looks like some of the young men who studied here went on to serve in the Confederate Army, although none of them were famous or recognizable names but they did have some of their schooling here at the Fox House, little realizing how prominent this place would be in May of 1864. So we're on the south bank of the North Anna River, we're on the Confederate side of the river, and as the Battle of Pennington's Redoubt raged on the afternoon of the 23rd, Robert E. Lee tried to configure his defenses to guard the river. And at some point before the battle began, he stopped in his reconnaissance, uh, according to local tradition at least, stopped here on the porch, which was much more elaborate in 1864 on this, uh, th what would have been the back porch of the Fox House at that time, and uh, indulged in a glass of buttermilk, one of his favorite beverages, inexplicable to almost everyone. Uh, not coincidentally, he came down with dysentery right about then too, and I've always thought the two things might have been connected to one another, it's what you get for drinking buttermilk. But while Lee was sitting here drinking buttermilk, according to the local story, a Union rifled cannon shot came whistling in and lodged itself in the door frame right beside him as he was sitting on the porch and there is still a convenient uh, conical shaped hole in the door frame today uh, and obviously the shell did not explode or maybe it was a bolt of some sort and Lee had a narrow escape. There's only one source for that and it's from 1926 but the hole in the porch uh, wall does make a, um, a nice illustration and it could be a true story. Once the Federals started their attack, Confederate artillery deployed here around the Fox House. This is on a very prominent ridge. Edward Porter Alexander's 1st Corps artillery pounded the Union assaults before they reached Hennigan's Redoubt, firing in long-distance support. But as we learned earlier, Confederates lost Hennigan's Redoubt. They lost the Chesterfield Bridge. 
and ultimately then they had to abandon this piece of property because they had been flanked, could not necessarily defend this ground in an isolated manner, and so Lee and the Confederates withdrew back to the south. But before they did that, they had one particularly exciting episode, a site-specific thing connected to this house with people that we're all familiar with, which makes battlefield touring so much fun sometimes when you can connect dots this explicitly. So let's walk over to the south side of the house and see where this happened. So here's the south wall of Fox House, Ellington, the schoolhouse, the outbuilding is just behind the camera to the left rear as you look at this wall. And as the battle was developing and Porter Alexander's artillery and the Confederate First Corps infantry were gathered in the vicinity uh, and suffering from counter battery fire, this house automatically became a convenient bulwark. And so everyone who was in the vicinity crowded over here on this side using the, using the house as a protection against the incoming Union artillery. And among those who were here were Richard H. Anderson, uh, uh, Confederate Corps commander, and Moxley Sorrell of James Longstreet's staff, now on Anderson's staff, and Edward Porter Alexander, who's been mentioned several times. And both Alexander and Sorrell left good accounts of what happened at this precise spot. Not in this vicinity, but right at this precise spot. So I will read you Alexander's account. Be familiar to some of you anyway from his famous book. He said, the, being tired, I sat down on the sill of a closed basement window. And so we're going to import some talent here, bring in Gary Edelman to fill in as Edward Porter Alexander over to the window, which I, is now boarded up. I think he was a little taller. He was. <laughs> he was. That's the boarded up window, but uh, if the board were, be to, were to be removed, you'd see the window sill. So that's where Alexander was. He sat down on the sill of a closed basement window, several couriers standing just in front of me and holding horses. Just then, a shell cut off about 10 feet of a chimney top, which there ran up the wall. And you can see the uh, bulges on either side of Gary there. Those are, the, uh, those are the chimneys going up. There are double chimneys on this side of the Fox House. Alexander said, I could not jump clear of the bricks as they began to fall, for the couriers and horses were in the way. But as quick as a cat, I jumped on the sill about a foot above the ground and flattened my back against the window. The recess was scarcely four inches deep and the avalanche of bricks fell so close to me that when they were done falling, the slope of the pile completely covered my feet and ankles, which were badly bruised. Now I wanted to reenact this part of it as well, but we couldn't find enough bricks to make it work. Ah, but that's close. Alexander concluded by saying, long after the war, he said, there are a number of places on that line of railroad from Richmond to Fredericksburg, which I always like to look out at of the car windows as I go by, even to this day. And Parson Fox's house is one of them, for I would not like to have been killed by bricks. And his colleague, Moxley Sorrell, Chief of Staff, Confederate First Corps, said our Corps headquarters had made halt for the time in a beautiful grove where stood a large, old-fashioned Virginia residence with two immense brick chimneys at each gable. The shelling was so frequent and the small fragments flying everywhere were so annoying that most of us got under the lee of the gable. General Anderson, that's Richard H. Anderson, Dick Anderson, was coolly walking about the grove sucking on his big pipe and warned us that if a shell struck one of the chimneys, there might be trouble. We were perhaps two dozen sitting there, officers, orderlies, and some horses held by the bridle. Anderson was right. A crash, a bursting roar, and down came bricks and mortar on those not quick enough to skip out of the way. Now he had some details that Alexander left out. Sorrell says two of the couriers had a bad time of it, one with a broken leg and another with a fractured arm. Both were put into an ambulance and cursing and reviling at being wounded by loose brick bats instead of honorable bullets, they were carried to the rear. The laugh was decidedly on us. Well, the ultimate laugh, unfortunately, was on the Fox family who had their house damaged by all of this fighting. And then when the Confederates withdrew to create their inverted V, their, their upside down umbrella, they fell back probably a thousand yards to the south as part of that maneuver. And the Union troops using the captured Chesterfield Bridge were able to come up here and repurpose this high ground for their own uses. And so the line of Hancock's second corps 
during the Battle of North Anna from May 24, 25, 26 was essentially in the yard just beyond to the south behind and to the left of the camera uh, at short range this was the infantry line and so the Fox House was immediately in the rear of the Union 2nd Corps and it was pillaged extensively not moderately but extensively there's abundant material about that I will only read you one account of many to kind of set the tone a little bit this from a 17th Maine man he said Mr. Fox was the possessor of a finely furnished home and valuable library, oil paintings, chemical laboratory, elegant furniture, and works of art. The house was completely dismantled, and a fine piano, rare volumes, family portraits, sofas, and upholstered chairs were distributed through the earthworks. So there's a, there's a picture for you. Uh, we do know about Union officers here, have an account from May 24 about General Burney, division commander in the Second Corps, General Burnside commanding the 9th Corps and General Hancock commanding the 2nd Corps all in the yard doing precisely what their Confederate counterparts had done the previous day, that is using the other side of the Fox House to protect them from incoming Confederate shells. Now that the lines had been reoriented, uh, the House protected those Union officers. They had no bricks fall on them, but this place is just uh, covered with anecdotal material that ties together famous people with an extant building, part of what makes it a great site. Gary? Thanks, Bobby. I, I hope that you see, you know, uh, you know, there's some of these places we wouldn't have been able to take you um, even during one of our conferences, in this case the annual conference or the Grand Review. Um, but we hope this video can help you understand the Battle of North Anna a little bit better. There is a great state park um, that you can go visit and see some of the earthworks at the inverted V. There is also, um, you know, hope eventually the National Park Service will um, own some of the other land or take full possession of some of the other land that the Trust has been able to preserve. And you'll be able to really walk the North Anna Park. So we hope you enjoy it. And I want to go with one more thing too. We keep talking about E.P. Alexander. I suggest that a lot of the Trust members already know what we mean, but the book that Bobby referenced called Fighting for the Confederacy, uh, edited by Gary Gallagher, is written by E.P. Alexander, who seemed to be everywhere during the war, east and west, um, and just an unbelievable memoir of the Civil War, and one he never intended for publication so that it is perfectly frank. And he does things like this throughout. Do you notice how he helped you to see how he gazed back toward the Fox House and later and told that story and helps you picture it? He does the same thing at the Stone Bridge at Manassas. It is an absolute masterpiece. And if you want to balance it out with a Union thing, uh, read Charles Wainwright's um, A Diary of Battle, edited by Alan Nevins. So um, this was our trip to North Anna. We have a lot more to do. Um, thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation. And until we get to our next stop or you watch our next video, put a glass in the fridge, wait an hour, take it out, fill it with some buttermilk, and enjoy.